All right, folks, it's 2.20, so I'm going to get going. I think this is like auto-recording, so I think usually not a bad idea to start on time. Uh, my name is Patrick Ronthal. I teach at Boise State um, and the Department of Educational Technology. This session is called Creating and Facilitating Effective Discussions. Um, there's my website. I have my contact information at the end. But a little bit about me. Um, I see myself as an educator first and foremost. But I also, I research online learning. And so I, I'm definitely a research geek, but I've been an online instructor since early 2000s. Um, but I'm also really, I've spent time as an instructional designer, as an instructional developer, and a faculty developer. So I'm often trying to think of ways to kind of help other people teach online. I mean, back to the keynotes idea that only 9% really prefer to teach online. It's that, ty that type of number just fascinates me. Because I've turned down a job before where they told me I could only teach one course online at a time. So I'm one of those that I prefer to teach online because it does, there's certain, the pros, there are certain things that just work with my lifestyle and my personality. Um, but whenever I get into something like this, creating online discussions, is I, I'm kind of attacking it with all these um, ideas. And part of what th brought this topic up again, because I'd given a similar talk in 2004. 13 at Northwest e Learn. So I went through and resurrected these slides, and I'm like, oh, I got a starting place. And it's because a colleague of mine, Joni Dunlop, and I want to write um, basically a paper that's mining these ideas, these ideas of how do we make discussions not suck, right? Because when people talk about only 9% not liking to teach online, most of the time, the things that people don't like about teaching online is the discussions or the feeling like you're on 24-7. It's usually not the design part, right? Because you, it takes time, but once you get up and going, it's, it's usually it's the, the managing discussions and it's that day-to-day -day getting emails constantly. Those are the things that, in my experience, people don't like. But um, So this talk is really more of a conversation here. And so, uh, you know, they gave me an hour. Part of me says there's no way we'll spend an hour. The other part of me is like we could talk for days on this, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of catch-22. It's right after lunch. I mean, I'm yawning as I'm getting ready for this. So, um, so I, I realize there's that struggle. But the general idea is I'm going to start with talking about some background um, about you know online discussions, this topic. Then we're going to brainstorm. I'm going to have you get out a computer or device or pair up with someone, and there's a shared Google Doc. And we're going to crowdsource and get some ideas of what are effective ways. Because if you've taught online, you know at least things that don't work or things that do work. Or, or there might be things that work well for you, but maybe they don't work for other people. And so we'll, we'll, we want to kind of, we're going to spend some time crowdsourcing some ideas. And then we're going to actually look at a list that I sent out to the community of some of the ideas other people have shared online during the past two weeks with me. And then I'll go over some key themes, some evidence-based practices. So this is kind of my plan, but we, don't, we can scrap this and go any direction, right? So, um, so just to show of hands, how many people teach online in the room? Okay. How many are more instructional designers, faculty developers, that type? Okay. So nice mix, right? And, and with a topic like this, I try to break it down into thinking about that there is a design part, right, where faculty developers and instructional designers can help, but there's also this facilitation part and then grading part. And these are all kind of key elements to all of so, um, And so with this, definitely get your device out if you have one. Um, so just some background. So finish this, this sentence. For, if, for teachers, online discussions are difficult. Okay. <laughs> Crucial. Crucial. Okay. Thrilling. Really? I will take your class. <laughs> I have different experience. <laughs> Okay, a democratic kind of leveling the playing field, amplifying voices. Insight. Insight. Okay. Anyone else? Taxing. Taxing. Okay. Can I ask? What of course you may. Difficult if the students. I have low level ESL, so difficult if the students can't read. Definitely. Right. It's text based too. Right. And and some there's typing skills and there's all these other kinds of hidden curriculum that we don't always kind of think about. Where sometimes we're much more comfortable in a class just saying something and there's not a record of what we just said. Whereas, you know, yeah, definitely. Anything else? Sometimes people say a necessary evil, right? Um, you know, some people might even take the federal government kind of thing that you need substantive interaction, right? So what about... I think they're formative. 
Okay. Let me tell you what where the gaps are for learning. Definitely. Right. I mean, you you could even set this up of saying, what's the what do you instructors think of discussions, and then what do they think of online discussions? So we could even do that compare and contrast because sometimes they think we idealize the face to face classroom environment. We act like they're just it's such a great learning community and everyone's just holding hands and, and I see learning everywhere and I can just see it all, right? And it's like, well, I don't know about your classes, but that doesn't always happen, all right? All right, what about, what do you think discuss, students think? Your typical 18 to 22 year old, if that's typical, you know. What do they think of online discussions? Busy work. Busy work? Mm -hmm. Repetitive. Repetitive. Chance to interact. Okay, nice, positive. <laughs> Okay, and, and you might even even that right undergrads. Well, is this an undergrad, you know, thing non-traditional who's got years of experience and they're in a bit uh, uh, economics course and they've had great experience? They might value it versus right. I mean, so that's what do non-traditional students think about it? this? Kind of gets at your graduates love it. Okay, what else? What are other people's experience? Students saying what? Okay. Because for some of them, right, they might be removed enough where they don't spend a lot of time communicating online. And so just that whole nature is different, right? But there are others that, you know, an M MBA program, and they're in a, a, a group just like them, and it's great to talk, right? But what I want you thinking about is we can think of these kind of archetypes, what do so-and-so think, but there's not one right answer, right? It just depends, right? Some students do see value in it. Or some students, maybe they, they collectively hate online discussions, but it doesn't mean that they've not been in a class where there's been a good one, right? Or vice versa, right? Um, and, and so it's, it's not that just online discussions are inherently good or bad, but we do have these kind of people struggle with it, right? Because an online discussion doesn't just happen, right? Um, and we've all even had them in our own classes where some go really good and some go really bad or, or wow, I thought this was going to work out well. It just it did not work out well, right? And so it's one. So this is kind of the stuff that I've been grappling with is myself is um, the way that we do discussions. Typically, it's you have one to one to two discussions every week. It's usually a whole class. It's usually based on the textbook or reading. You know, what do you think about? Um, and and usually it's this kind of post one original post by like Thursday, reply to two people by Saturday Sunday, or it's some variation of this. And it, and and while there's there's a reason for some of this. Some of this works really well, but it, it can get stale. Or I've struggled with, oh gosh, another one of these, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so for me, it's I, I just been struggling with. Well, why do we have discussions? And forget about the federal government, the regular substantive interaction piece, right? But like, what's the value? Because I even try in my classes to take one week where there is no discussion. We work on a project or we do something else, right? But we, we are kind of creating our courses where they often look the same and they have the same type of two discussions each week and, and it just gets in this kind of repetitive kind of um, thing. And so for me, I've been questioning, you know, why are they asynchronous? You know, why do we have them every week? Why do we grade them? And so these are some of my own struggles because I, I'm probably better in the design end than the facilitation end. I can design really good courses, but I'm kind of a procrastinator. I'm not really good at facilitating. I dip in and out. I'm, you know, um, and so these are things that knowing about myself, I've been trying to struggle with, well, how do I do a better job and how do I help other people do a better job? And so I've been searching for this kind of balance. You know, um, I want to be one of those who prefer to teach online, but it's, it's how do I do this, right? How do I make it better? So what I want us to do is to brainstorm now. We're going to take about 15 minutes. Ideally, you would get in groups. Not everyone has a device. You don't have to get in a group. You can do it by yourself. But there's a Google Doc. And after you guys log in, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to log in. Then I'm going to pull it up. There's basically three sections. And I want you just to share an idea, a tip. A tip that you might give someone who, um, a brand new faculty member, a colleague. But there's, it's basically separated in design. How do you, what's a tip on how to design a good discussion? There's another section on how to facilitate. So if you're going to talk to a brand new instructor, what would you say? You know, log in every day to check. I mean, wh what are your facilitation tips? And then the last part is grading. Because one of the things I want to do as a side project is I want to collect rubrics 
that people use for grading online discussions and compare? Because there's so many different ways to grade online discussions, and I think it would be fascinating to look at the whole. Um, but the hope here is that you actually talk to each other. Um, but if you don't want to, this is back to, you know, you can do it silently online. But after you log in, I'm going to pull it up and you can see. If you don't have the device, you want to come up to my computer or the, their computer, computer I'm using, you can do it. But I just want each of you to try to leave, leave one idea, one idea of what you think. And so it's tinyurl.com 2019 discuss. And if you hate this idea, you won't hurt my feelings if you leave. And you don't have to whisper either. You can be loud. Best ideas, guys. It's funny, we're all trying to type in the same place. It's it can be, be organized chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're on a phone. Because right. sometimes you're like, I don't know where. That's part of the fun. Okay.
that's the very end of the Go, and we're going to take about five more minutes and then we'll start discussing going through these. No name following. <laughs> It's if you log in anonymously, I th think that's just what Google does is it gives you an avatar of an animal. I believe any of the Google suites, so I believe Google Slides would do the same or any of those. Yeah, you just don't want. Yeah. For whatever reason, though, Google Docs is where people do this the most often, so you see it. About three more minutes, guys, to so wrap up your ideas.
folks, let's bring it back together. So hopefully you guys see just even the value of using a Google Docs as well. So I did at one point, I did a, something similar to this at like six different conferences, and I kept collecting doing a new one, and I took all those and I published a paper on crowdsourcing ideas from best online instructors. And so this is a way we, when you have a group that has a lot of ideas, Right? You can bring it together and you can start sharing ideas. Um, something that did come up that I forgot to say is one time I did realize that Google Docs, I think, only allows you have 50 simultaneous at people. So it was EduCalls or something, and I think there was like 75 in the room, and it, um, I realized that didn't work. Um, but, I, but I do want, in the back of your mind, think because here we have this list, right, that you can keep adding to, but then it's public, anyone can um, take. And so um, I wasn't sure how many people would be here. So before this, I also sent this out to on social media to, and some other colleagues. So I have another list to compare to, right? But if we start looking through there, the idea behind, in my mind, separating, creating from facilitating and grading is because you can have a really well-structured discussion. If you're not facilitating, it can fall flat, right? And so it's, it's, there's, these are three kind of areas that we need to focus on. Um, and so let's... So the first one up here, whoa, is supplement text-based discussions with synchronous web meetings. I added that because that's something I do and I wanted a starting point. But, um, but this next one of yours talks about for large classes split, split into smaller discussion groups, right? And so we have, for instance, our uh, MBA classes, that was 75 students, say. And it's, it's how do you have a discussion with 75 people, right? And there's move platforms have ways that they do an upvote, but for most of us, the way that you successfully deal with that is you put in like groups of 10, or you'll do the different groups. Some people will use the same groups for the whole semester, so it's almost like you know little mini classes. Others will um, lock those groups down so you can't see into other groups. Some like to leave it open so you can still see what the other groups are doing and discussing, but you have your primary group, and so that's a great one. So give students a prompt for the initial post Right? And that's a standard one. We, you, know, you, you usually don't just say discuss this week. Usually there's a prompt. But what's important here, too, is the second part is prompt framing what a good reply on the topic might look like. Right? And so this is kind of that modeling. Because I think sometimes we just assume, because students live on certain platforms, that just, they know how to academically discuss things. And they, and they don't often. Right? And so it often sometimes helps to model that. And it might not be something you do every week. Right? But it could be something the first discussion or two, or if you change it up, to help model what a good reply is. You know, the hard thing always with modeling is then you have some students who just spit back the exact same, and they just copy, basically. And, but sometimes, depending on the level of the class, that might be what they need to start learning how to do it. Um, leapfrog discussion. Start in week one. Follow-up is due the second week, while a discussion topic is also start at the same time. So I believe that's kind of saying how you're going to overlap them, right? Because this is one of the things, too, that some people argue is that we have these discussions, but usually they just get going, and then, oh, we're on to week two, and it's over, right? And it's hard sometimes if you teach seven- or eight-week classes because it's, well, how do you have, right? I mean, do you only have three discussions? But some people, it's this quantity versus quality. Sometimes having just four good in-depth discussions, maybe they go a couple weeks, would be better than to have a lot of these short, little, shallow ones. 
right? And so it's thinking about how we do this and how we give students time to process some of this. You know, because one of the things that happens is that, you know, especially busy adults, it's Sunday evening and they're just, they're just firing something off the hip, right? Or I'm watching my daughter, she's trying to do something on her phone, and it's like, come on, right? You're not even giving this any time. Um, instructor doesn't always lead the conversation, but does jump in to summarize and elaborate, right? And so I think there's three kind of things wrapped up in this. One is that, you know, an instructor-led discussion where it's always looking at the instructor, right, for what he or she can really kind of, you know, make a discussion go off the rails and just kind of be really stale and boring. But it's also saying, it's assuming this, that the instructor is also monitoring them, right? So they're not just, it's not just hands off. They're keeping an eye on the discussion. Maybe it's not every day, maybe it's every other day, but they're checking to see where there might be things that aren't going right. But then at the end is summarizing. So my wife is one who, when she teaches online, she doesn't like to take part in the weekly discussions, but she'd summarize them at the end of each week. Um, I've seen other people take it the opposite, where they'll take part and then they have students summarize at the end of the week, the discussion. And so there are different ways to do this, right? But it's this idea of um, don't monopolize the discussion. A colleague of mine, Joni Dunlop, what she does is, I think she, and she tells students this, she doesn't get into the discussions till Friday. So the discussions start early in the week, but she doesn't want to take over to the discussion because then kind of her voice overrules everything else in ways. And so she tries to wait and let things develop. Um, so writing scaffold, something I learned was, or I disagreed with, right? And so this is part of this thing about even what we say, oh, have a prompt. Writing a really good prompt that gets the type of stuff is, is, is hard. I mean, that's one of the things I want to do is I want every instructor to give me like their best prompt they've ever used, right? Because I think that, you know, they're, they're not going to be, what do you, Smith in chapter three say? I mean, it's not that, right? That's something much more interesting. Students must post three times in a certain time frame, but their posts can either be new posts or replies, and I limit the number of total threads students can start. As a result, the discussion is more student-driven and focused, less where students who synthesize can, or synthesizers can synthesize. Um, okay, so I think, I'm not sure if this means post three times in a given week, or, or it says a certain time frame, so it just depends, right? But I think it's controlling this kind of, um, one, it's, you know, sometimes people will use protocols where they'll even say, and 200 words or less, right? And so it's ways that you just kind of control the way people post. The other thing is I've done in some of my classes that I, I consider discussion light. So like one on web development, they just are, their 10 best discussion posts are graded for the semester. So it's not everyone's graded every week and it's, right? And so it gives them that kind of choice but it also gives them that idea that they don't have to jump in everything and that they can do what they do well. Treat it like a seminar. Students sign up, host one discussion topic over the term, work with them to prepare initial posts and then facilitate, creates ownership, builds community. So this kind of student-moderated discussions is something people do. I've always struggled with this because I try not to have more than one discussion a week and if I have more than a certain number of students, that can be challenging, but I know people have done this and done this well. And especially if you imagine a big class and you have different groups, there are definitely ways that this can be really w done well. So a case study on a controversial topic, right? And I think this idea here is the controversial topic gets people to, um, you know, it's not is vanilla ice cream better than chocolate, right? It's something much more. But some of these really provocative topics, if you want to get in, and it depends on the class, it should be appropriate. But if you want to debate the ethics of, you know, eating meat or abortion or some of these things, you got to realize if it's very controversial, you need to be all hands on deck because those things can go off the rails real quick, right? Um, and sometimes setting expectations, modeling what's a good response, a professional critical way to disagree rather than uh, name calling and other things. Um, create assignments that allow students to apply course content to the real world or imagine how it might apply in the career related to the subject. Right, so I think this is this idea that don't just focus on the textbook, but let's bring in what's happening in the real world. Let's bring in the workplace. You know, so it could be one of those things that um, you know you find stuff in the news and and you kind of bring that in. So they start seeing that it's not just busy work, but this kind of really applies to this job. Right, um, if it's accounting, could you get a quote or something from someone who works in the field that gives you a good thing, and then they help realizing why this really matters. Um, 
Keep the prompt open-ended, not, you know, correct, where they just say yes, agree, right, or me too, you know, those types of things. Um, students can be facilitators, so that kind of was um, what we talked about before, start conversations. Um, have students connect, we see another theme here, right, what they're learning in their personal real life. Um, and this, this one's great, so voice write. So this is one of the things, we get stuck in this idea that it has to be text-based. You know, voice write, you run into problems with licensing and there's, there's other, um, they've done better with accessibility lately, but, um, but voice write's a way where you can do um, a presentations and they can give text, audio, or video feedback. Flipgrid's another one, but Flipgrid, you have to give video feedback. The nice thing, or video reply, the nice thing about voice thread is that they do have the option. Um, in one study, they found though that when given the option, most students still would just use text reply. And that um, this one instructor, what she did, Michelle, she would require them to do one video one. And once they did that, they were more likely to post more video replies once they got used to it. But that she had to require them to do that. Um, have them relate to it in the real world. See, that's another theme, right? Because this is what happens. The students are constantly wondering, this is busy work. What does this have to do with anything, right? And, and I think this is sometimes easier in professional graduate degrees or things where it's clear that this is tied to a job, where sometimes you might be teaching a, a gen ed kind of course where they're taking it because they have to, not because it's related to the career. So, but once again, it's important to help them understand, why are you taking Art 101 or why are you taking whatever this class is? My students are required to post six substantive posts. I give them prompts. They are free to create their own. So free to create their own. Someone elaborate on that. Okay, maybe not. All right. The question in my mind is, what I'm thinking is that, and it depends on, I guess, the, the LMS, but some of them you can create your own. So if it's there's something that you want to start your own discussion post that week, you can kind of go that different direction as as I'm assuming, rather than, you know, in a given week. Allows reluctance seems the way to get in as the week goes on and move into more analytic, provocative, creative prompts. And I think this is one of the things too, especially if students don't necessarily know how to do this. And so sometimes having these kind of real easy, trusting, safe topics to begin with. And then if you get into the more provocative ones, once they feel a little more comfortable, Right, and you help get them ready there. So let's move on. Yes, that's exactly. More, or is that good? Crystal's like, um, <laughs> all right. Student introductions before introducing more academic topics. Right, so this is becoming standard place. You see it in Quality Matters, right? But this important idea of that, you know, you want students to get to know each other, or at least have some type of icebreaker introduction. You know, but the problem sometimes with this is some of this community building types of things, it doesn't just stop after week one. So sometimes it's good a few weeks in to have another kind of icebreaker type of thing. Sometimes small groups, what's nice about that is it's easier for me to get to know these eight people than to know these 40 people, right? And so that's the nice thing when you think about these small groups. Um, post something incorrect, right? And ask them to correct it. I've also done things early on, this was using WebCT, is I would do a messed up post just to show them. I would intentionally screw something up and be like, oops, sorry, ignore that, and go on, right? Just so they saw me make an error and realize it's not the end of the world, just move on. Um, Use discussion prompts that facilitate students helping each other. Okay. Modern technology, so I like this idea. So in a, um, Slack, or it's the idea that one of the problems, we, we want students to learn how to communicate, communicate professionally, communicate ideas academically, but we do this in a, in a Blackboard or a Canvas, but once they graduate, they're never going back in an LMS, most likely, right? And so it's not really a professional kind of environment where Slack, Twitter, or some of these places teach them the value of using this, you know, basically, if you start learning how to use Twitter, you start learning that, wow, this is public. How do I write this in a different way when there is a global audience? And there are ways with different platforms to control privacy. Um, but Slack is a great example of something where um, some people have had really good success. And so it's something that then it's on their phone. It's because one of the things that happens with online discussions is 
you got to go, you got to log into the course, you got to get over it, mm -hmm. especially like Blackboard, the online app sucks. Yeah. And so some of them, the online app's better, right? But it, it's still, it's different than like just a text message or a group chat. And so other people have used different types of text messaging tools out there, but Slack is definitely um, a good one that I've heard good things about. Um, ask students to comment on a compelling part of the film they watch. Right, and so I, I think the bigger thing about this is two things: is sometimes use media and have them. You know, people talk about like posting a real provocative image and have them react to it, right? And sometimes not even lead them, but have them thinking through media in a different way. So it's not just read, write, read, write. Right? Sometimes I start multiple threads and ask students to post that's most interesting to them. So this idea of choice, right? And so some people have three discussion that week and say choose one that resonates with you um, optional discussions um, for students in a literature class to share create creative assignments and give feedback to each other they can be more personal and give students the ability to opt into sharing but also the optional discussions too is I've had students do things where um, I'm taking a message design course and they have to go to this website that you type something in and it uses GPS to, to create words based out of buildings and so it's or or there's um a van gogh where you go and draw a van gogh thing and you share your drawing things that are just optional they're fun they're community building but they basically take your brain in a different direction right um there's another one you can build roller coasters and so you can you use these little things and you have them share and go and people come back and be like oh that was a great study break um where was i um Students engage with new content that builds on what they wrote their threads about. Um, have initial posts post on, focus on a first reading and then responses make connections with a second reading. And you, you could even do this with, you think about even um, with small groups where you can have students peer review each other's work, right? And so a lot of times discussions, we find them, they're focused on the reading or the content where they can be focused on products that we do. Right, and so I can post something and get feedback, and we can talk about how we make this better. Um, give students a poll to vote on the topic or a book to discuss. That's a good idea. See, some of these things though get struggling when you think about um, well, how do you plan for that, right? And so some people like to plan or replicate. Um, some people, it's very uneasy to be like, all right, we're going to figure out what we're going to do these final four weeks. Let's vote, right? Um, all right, share an example of how create, you create effective online discussions. Um, so research scavenger hunt, right? Browse liter literary criticism on a short story, bring back useful quote. Okay, personal application in response to a sci-fi novel. If you could change reality through your dreams, what would you try to dream? Interesting. Some discussions are not discussions. They may point to a public forum. Okay, so this is the idea um, in mini peer review, like I mentioned, is that sometimes a discussion can be about go look at this resource, right? And it, and it can kind of, and comment if necessary. Like they don't always have to be these certain ways that we think about a discussion. I think what happens is we idealize the graduate seminar type course that's like 12 people around a table, where a lot of, t a lot of our classes face-to-face -face aren't like that. They're not having these rich discussions. They're often big. They might be using clickers or other ways to have interaction, but they don't always have to be this idealized thing. Um, have students discuss a short video, so we're seeing some themes coming up here. Icebreakers, set up a scenario. You were a student the first day, what do you need to know? So I have my literature students, I think I know who did, write Dear Abby letters from the perspective of the characters in the text we we're studying. So I used to, um, on this idea, I had a colleague who used to create a Facebook page on characters from um, literature things. So if you were going to create a Atticus fan or whoever, right, what would his Facebook page look like? And, and um, Facebook makes it harder to create these dummy pages like they used to. Um, I impersonate a student, and honestly, on the first day, <laughs> Anonymous hamsters going for it. <laughs> but I, and this is one of the things I'll come up, and we're going to jump into some of the public lists here. We can't go through all this. Um, 
But one of the things um, people said is never post anonymous. But there's actually can be very value sometimes in anonymous postings, but it's risky, right? Um, because you need to trust your, your group, right? I would trust this group for someone to post something anonymously. But I've had student groups where I'm like, no, I don't want you to have that um, ability. Um, OK, so some facilitating tips. Um, offer extra credit for the first student that gets the discussion started. That's great. And I could see either telling them ahead of time that or not. Um, I try to contribute comments in the discussion, similar to I'd redirect a face-to-face. -face. Okay, so this goes back to this monitoring. You have to monitor it, and sometimes that Socratic or that follow-up question kind of redirect it or keep it going. Right? Sometimes students post something, they just they're not elaborating. You're like, what do you mean? Please say more. And sometimes that just can you elaborate can do a lot. Um, assign discussion leaders. Right? So th this is, it can be, we talked about discussion, having students moderate the discussions, but discussion leaders is you can just have someone who they're in charge in their group, let's say of 10 people, of making sure those discussions keep going. Right? They don't necessarily have to play the teacher role, but they're kind of the, the cheerleader, the rah-rah. Um, try to let the discussions flow without interfering, right? So this goes back to that idea we talked about earlier. So two discussions per week, I respond to every student in the first one randomly in the second one and I don't keep track. Um, when I grade, I make one comment and then refer them back to the discussion to see my feedback there. I use discussions rather than having students write individual work for Dropbox. So there's, um, and it's funny, um, I usually talk about Kim. Kim, I, I know at one point you would keep a list of your students and you'd keep track of each student you responded to to make sure you replied at least a couple times each student. So I give this example all the time. Because that's an example where I say, you got to find something that works for you. That would not work for me. But I love the idea, right? I mean, if she's making sure she's touching each student multiple times and that she's not going to miss it. Because often we talk about social presence. We talk about things that we do to build it. But we don't often talk about things we do that destroy it, right? Or when someone posts something and no one responds, and there's that silence. And that, we're at the end of the week, and everyone's moved on. Or it's even worse when it's not the end of the week. Someone posts, and it just gets nothing. Right? Well, this is when you're monitoring at that level, you can make sure that every student feels heard or touched or responded to. Right? And I think that's really important. I give you praise all the time. Um, provide a weekly um, summary. So we talked about this. Um, try to let the discussion flow. All right, we talked about that. Two discussions. Pop in the discussions with the caveat that you have announced you will do this. So part of this is about one of the key things is, is being clear about your role. So in the syllabus, how set up your expectations. So if you're the type where you're not going to get in the discussions, but you're going to post summaries, tell students that. Right? Then they understand how you're doing it. It doesn't mean that there's one right way to do this, but it's really clear to make sure that they're not guessing, that they know. Or if you're like, no, I'm active in the discussions. And, you know, and, and often the active ones, they'll pick up on that real quick. They'll know from the first week. Um, I'm not active in my discussions, but whenever I do an introduction, I always respond to each student to welcome to the class and say, and sometimes it even you know, feels repetitive, but I always, always make sure I do that. Um, participate by responding to three to five students in each discussion. So that's one of the things some people say, is I monitor discussions. I don't actively participate, but I will respond some. If I don't respond, it doesn't mean I'm not reading or your discussion's not in and I just randomly, you know, and so just being real clear on that. Um, and that helps build that presence where they know that you're there, that teaching presence. So this gets that, that last point I talked about. Always respond to a student if they have no other responses from students. Give students choice. We talked about this. Smaller groups, we talked about this. Enlist tutors. That kind of gets at that thing earlier about discussion leaders. Um, all right. Grading. I give, I think it's students. I give students a rubric, which they use to self-assess their performance each week. Occasionally raise or lower their assessment, but the most part they're pretty accurate, right? So this kind of bean counting is what some, I, I hate it, but it's, um, it's, I just don't do it well. And so what, one of the things I know that uh, I've seen colleagues do, and we do it in a teaching course we use, is they have a survey, um, basically, or a quiz that where you have to self-assess just in the survey tool, and it populates the grade. So you have that rubric, and the students are self-assessing. And you know you could just randomly spot check to see if you, you know. But even, especially with graduate students, you probably wouldn't even have to change one very often, 
right? But there are ways that you can kind of automate or offload or put on. I've also seen people, whether weekly, have students fill out the rubric and they have to explain and maybe even copy and paste what post they did. And, and kind of, or I've seen people do it at the end of the semester where they don't do it weekly. At the end of the semester, they basically document how they participate in the class. I've heard criticism of doing that, um, especially for graduate students, which is who I work with, that uh, I'm paying mm -hmm. graduate school. Mm -hmm. You're a professor mentoring me. Mm -hmm. I expect your and respect your engagement with me. And mm -hmm. so there's a kind of bug. I've seen it on, on one professor who just like, they just felt like it was the professor was like, oh, the students can take care of themselves. Really. So mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a minute, I came to graduate school to be part of this group of academics and I want your thoughts on this. And so I mean, it might be okay occasionally, but I feel like the professors have to realize that that's their expectation. And really wanting to learn from you. And, and I guess for me, if I'm giving you detailed feedback in other ways, that yeah. so if I'm giving you detailed yeah, so feedback on your paper versus yeah. a rubric we on discussions. Yeah, like, yeah. all we did is self-assess ourselves, and they just felt like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think with any of these things, right, it's a fine line in, a, in that it, you can do it well. But if students feel like you're, right, you're just having them teach themselves, yeah. right, um, you'll definitely get some pushback. But, but there's um, the flip side, too, is how you have them provide all that at the end and then write up what they learned. And, I mean, you can make that into a learning activity where then you can give them feedback on it and be like, oh, I like how you did this. I like seeing your growth over, you know. So I think it's all about how you kind of do that. Um, but with that said, I don't, like I mentioned, the, the online quiz thing, the self-assess. I don't do that, but I've seen it done, right? And for some of these things, you have a class of 100 people. Sometimes... The, there are certain time-saving, work-saving things where you got to focus your efforts in certain ways, right? And where do you get more bang for your buck? But your point's a, a, yeah, this a great one. Yeah, like all that, and there, I was like reading the, the evaluations. Class, evaluation class, and like, what happened in here? And then, yep. Like, but, so, but I've also, you know, and this is the struggle we sometimes have with students is, you know, for me, I can cite learning theory, I can cite all these reasons why to do some of these things, but sometimes students just want to be lectured at and want to test, right? I, and so, but just because that's what they want, I don't think that's always my job just to do what they want, right? And so it's a fine line. Student satisfaction is really important. I have a graduate program. If students aren't satisfied, right, we don't have enrollments, I don't have a job, right? And so it's, there's definitely something real there, but there's, there's also a fine line of just doing things, you know, to make them happy, you know? And so it's, it's a balance. So, totally, thank you. Um, I include giving feedback here, I give feedback both within the discussions so they can see and grading work. With. So one of the things I like here is this idea of, so I'll certain assignments have students post the assignment rather than privately in a Dropbox or an assignment or something. They have to post it public in the discussion and I can give feedback there. I don't give a grade, so there's no FERP issues, but then you can publicly, right? It's the same way you might do it in a class where you, you might have people walk around, you are creating websites. Everyone's walking around and doing the showcase looking. You know, the same thing could happen with papers or other things. But there are ways that you can have students turn the work in, but then you're giving that feedback publicly in a way where other students can see, well, he, he or she is engaged. He or she is teaching, right? Because too often, sometimes our grading is this thing that's done privately, or our feedback is done privately, where other people don't benefit from it. I've also done it though, I used to, I give audio video, I give video screencast feedback to at least one assignment every time I teach. Um, I used to do this when I was an adjunct um, for every assignment for this one class and I post the feedback for, and then I found out no one was looking at the other students' video feedback. I thought it'd be great, right? You'd want to see, wow, this is a good product, let's see what the instructors, no one had the time for that. Um, so I stopped even doing that because I'm like, they're not watching this. Um, all right, let's move on. Holistically, one rating per week, plus comments, even though they're participating in many discussions, I look at each student's posting, I respond to each student's at least one to two times, ask them questions to continue, I use a scoring rubric, plus comments. Sometimes I assess reading instead of replying. Okay, I ask students to read a certain number of posts. Okay, so this is one of the things too, and there's different literature on this, but lurkers, right, and the power for a lurking. And it's hard to really kind of watch this, but we, we tend to praise the extrovert in our classes, in our society, really, right? We want the person who can get up there and talk. We want the ones who are, um, we're 
you know, the introvert sometimes want to just sit back and watch. And, and it's really hard to kind of assess and find ways where they don't have to be the most active in the discussions to really be learning and taking things away. And so that's part of that struggle is how do we grade in a way where we're, we're honoring that, that option, right? But at the same time, if everyone's just lurking, right, and no one's posting, right, we're not, nothing's happening. Um, offer a lot of feedback on the first few discussions, but dial it back. Okay, please look at the rubric. Um, learn to use the LMS tools to become more efficient. You don't want to try to track this stuff on paper or Excel. But some people really like Excel to do some of this stuff. So I've seen other people find the two window thing really nice. Um, and some of these LMSs are, a lot, are getting a lot better where you can, in the grade book, you can see their discussions right there. Um, there was a time when that wasn't the case. Um, so here's some resources. We're not going to jump in those. I'm going to really quickly look at this. Um, See, I don't even have time for this. Um, we spent way too much time. So we'll keep going. But this is basically from the community. These slides I uploaded to the Dropbox. The links to both of these documents are in the slides. So later, you know, when you have nothing else to do and you're drinking a nice pint, you can, um, you can take a look at these. But just even as I tried to summarize, like, some big ideas here, you know, they talk about um, using small groups, having creative discussions like activity debates. People talked about controversial prompts. Um, you know, one person talked about being consistent, authentic. So this is the idea. If maybe I'm not that person who is going to be t taking part in every discussion, right? Well, being true to who I am, I don't have to be a different person in my online classroom, but being transparent and authentic about what it is. Um, some argue that you want less structure, that too much structure can ruin the discussion. Um, I often find the opposite. I'm more of on the structure um, end. But set minimum weekly posts, student moderated. Um, one talked about as a data collection tool. Um, and so you can read some of these um, using guidelines, different types of discussions. And so this is, and they talk in here also about protocols. So there's a book on online protocols, and it's on here. But also Joni Dunlop, the colleague of mine who we're going to write up, she has something called the guide, I think it's downline, dirty guideline. I don't remember now. Um, but guidelines for online teaching, um, and it's in the CEO online handbook, but one of the things she talks about is these protocols and discussion protocols, whether it's, you know, the fishbowl or different things, the last word, there's all these different protocols, and I'm going to show you an example of one in a minute. But time, it's funny, I told you an hour's not enough, but like a good... Excuse me, where was that document that you have up? It is, I will show it, it's right here. This is the URL. Um, let me get in a... Okay. Because I didn't know how many people we'd have here, um, and I didn't know if this would be as fruitful of a thing. Um, and so I had a backup plan and went to the community to see what they thought. Um, but if you look at it, it's a lot of the similar ideas, right, that you can see there. And at the end of this community one, and I think about 30 people responded, there's a couple of resources too. And so I tried to shorten things people said. If for some reason you saw my reply on social media for this, I haven't up put new data in the last 48 hours. So if someone's added something, it could still be growing. But, all right, evidence-based practices. So one of the things that I do and I recommend, especially like instructional designers, when you have a topic and you want to know something more about it, you go to Google Scholar and just search that topic and read the top 10 articles. Then if you change the date to say the last three years, and read those top 10, so read 20 articles, you can usually get a real kind of quick gist on, on a topic. And so I've done this with um, online discussions, and basically 10 themes from those 20 articles came out. And so number one, you can see this is a lot of some of the stuff we talked about. Um, it's offer students choice. Um, prior experience matters. So how do you build on that, especially with graduate students, especially not traditional students? They want to talk about their life experience and how but also prior experience matters in the sense of ha have they done this before? Do they, are they confident, right? We used to talk about, oh, online learners are so isolated and alone. I think that was a really 15 year ago kind of idea. I don't think as many, we are much more comfortable, generally speaking, communicating online and in groups with people. And we're getting better with this. Class size influence is what works. When you have a class of 200, you, it's, it's a lot harder, especially if you don't have TAs or some kind of discussion leaders, it's really hard to have rich discussions weekly. Um, requires students to take part. So Karen Swan's done research where it's basically, if you don't grade the discussions, you know, more the, the majority of students aren't participating. So you need to require participation, whatever that looks like. 
mix in synchronous sessions. And so, you know, people talk about, why well, I miss the face-to-face. -face. Well, live synchronous sessions with video, you can have face-to-face, -face, right? It's mediated, right? But you can see each other. You can see body things. You, and there's definitely pros and cons, obviously, with time scheduling and you name it. Um, set expectations, provide clear guidelines. So we talked about this. How do, you, how do you make it real clear? So there's no mystery. They know how they can be successful in your class. Especially when there's classes where maybe participation or discussion is 10, maybe 15%. They can't get an A if they don't do it right. So it, it is kind of high stakes in that sense. Um, have strategies and discussion questions um, that matter. Um, provide timely multiple types of feedback. So it's one of those things that Students, especially if it's high stakes discussions and you're just grading them at the end of 16 weeks, well, that's too late. You know, so often people recommend that kind of weekly so they know if they're missing the mark, they know how to get there. Um, instructor plays a key role. Denon's done a bunch of work on this that um, students, you know, we like to think of this perfect learning community where the teacher's not in the center, but the bottom line is the teacher gives grades. And as long as the teacher gives grades, the students are going to notice what the teacher does, right? And, and they care about that feedback. They want to know that uh, they want to learn from that teacher. Um, and students can feel isolated. It's getting better, but students, especially, um, you know, when they're at the end of the day, their second job, they're trying to log in, and they don't really know what they're doing. And there's different also research on community college students struggling more with learning online, um, second language learners. The list goes on. A lot of these students who online's meant to almost help them the best. They struggle the most, right? And so we need to recognize that. Um, so some of my research often focuses on social presence. And so some of my own research has talked, has really found that one-on-one -on -one communication matters. So students really want to hear from the instructor one-on-one. -on -one. So whether it's an email, a phone call, there's direct things. And they're time consuming, right? But this kind of goes back to Kim's strategy of making sure she's touching base. These things matter. Low-tech strategies can help. The phone can be amazing when things are going off, right? So especially if things start to escalate, the first thing I do is pick up that phone. Because all of a sudden when you're talking to them, um, past future relationships matter. So research on cohorts and other things. So when students can basically have talked about in cohorts, when they know they're going to work with the student the next semester, they're more invested in learning that student, getting along with that student, et cetera. Same with um, instructors. Group projects can help. You know, um, it's kind of like looping in K-12 class, you know, an elementary classroom. It's great when you have a great teacher that you get to have that same teacher second year. It's not so great if it's a bad teacher. Well, groups, when it's a successful group project, it's been shown in some of the research I've done to really help establish and build that social presence. Students are communicating offline and outside of class because they've had those successful experiences. The flip side, though, when it's bad, it's bad. Um, small groups, so we talked about that. Protocol, so this is a... Um, talked about some various ones of these. Um, you can Google these, you'll find them out, but the final post, last post, um, designated readers, rotating threads, these are all different ones. This is an example of rotating threads. Set up threaded discussions with a provocative issue in groups of four to five, have students rotate into a new forum, have each group record their ideas. Once they've rotated, give students time to revisit. Is that final activity, have them summarize what they learned. Right? So this is just different ways that you can structure discussions where they don't feel like it's the same thing every week. And there's, like I said, this is, these are a few. Joni has a list um, in her one thing, but there's also a book that came out a few years ago. I wrote on the death to the digital Dropbox, and this is just this idea that, as I mentioned, Boris, having students share their work publicly with each other in the course. Right? So it's, it's not things that are just secretly hidden into the structure. I secretly grade it and hide it back. Right? Um, and when assessing, you know, be thinking about everything from graded, ungraded, um, quantity versus quality. Um, you know, sometimes people have really detailed rubrics. Sometimes a checklist is, is you know, is it, you know, on three, you know, a scale of three points, right? You get three if it's excellent, two is it's proficient, one needs improvement, zero. You know, so lots of different ways. Back to this, you can have the student self-assess or the teacher can assess. You can do it at an individual or group level. Other idea that Joni um, wrote about a while ago was karma points. So this is the idea of each student has points, and they can basically give points to other students. So they're grading. So each week, let's say, every student has three karma points. 